day traders from around the globe, welcome to What Are Futures in Real Life? It's nice to meet you. My name is Jeremy Alexander Newsom, and we're really excited to present the only comprehensive futures program on the entire internet that is 100% free. Zero sales pitch of any kind, just pure, fun, informative information. The Futures Program is presented by Karen Shugan, who's an amazing friend of mine and a wonderful trader. She is just absolutely crushing futures. This program has been over a year in the making and you're going to absolutely love the teaching, the slides, the information, the content, and the program. This is only class one of many more, so make sure to hit that subscribe button. Put in any comments, questions, or thoughts below, or you can also email me anytime if you need anything, Jeremy at reallifetrading.com. We also have a Twitter, we have a Facebook, we have an Instagram, we do the whole social media thing. So make sure you get exposed to Real Life Training as much as possible because we put out content that's free all the time, literally changing the entire industry standard on stock market education. Enjoy class one of What Are Futures? It's showtime, folks. It's showtime. Uh, live from sunny Southern California, it's the Real Life Trading, full year in the making, first ever of all time, futures class. What the heck are futures? My name is Karen, and I'm here to help each and every one of you reach the next level in your trading, not just in futures, but in all the markets you trade. How's everybody doing tonight? Um, feeling good? <laughs> oh, great. I'm excited too. And I'm, I'm ready to get started. This is so awesome. And you can probably hear in my voice, I'm super excited, super nervous. I've got so much information to share with you, how to trade futures, which futures to trade, the best times of day, um, some charting techniques that'll probably be new for a lot of you, as well as some auction market theory, volume profile, reading market structure, market conditions, order flow, cumulative delta, and the trade setups that work best under the different conditions, those charts reveal, <laughs> as well as global intermarket relationships, correlations, data releases, news events. There is just so much. It can't possibly fit into one measly little webinar. In fact, it won't even fit into the first four of them. We're going to get into all of it, but we can't possibly cover everything tonight. I promise we will get there as the classes progress. And they're all free from start to finish. Thank you, Real Life Trading. Thank you, Jeremy Newsom, Angie Barbosa. And I have to give a special thanks to, to Ashley for helping uh, with the slides. Um, I'm here to tell you the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth as I know it at absolutely no cost to you. So everybody, put away your credit cards. You won't need them. Our goal is to help you learn and succeed as traders and in real life, not separate you from the contents of your wallet. But first, this important message from the legal department. Um, trading is risky. Never risk money you can't afford to never see again. No one clicks your mouse but you. Click responsibly with full knowledge and personable accountability. Blah. Each decision to click that mouse is yours and yours alone. Moving on, I have this theory. We are all retail traders with a retail education. We each have bits and pieces we've cobbled together from books, the internet, webinars, seminars, and of course, those lovely painful trading experiences. And we're always looking for more information, but we never get more than a few fragments from any one place. And sometimes that one little shard of information costs thousands of dollars. <clears throat> but we've never seen the picture we're trying to put together. We don't even know if we have the right pieces to make the whole picture or if we're missing pieces. My goal in this series of classes is to give each of you the pieces you're missing and then put all those bits and pieces together to form a more complete view of this global puzzle we call the futures and equities market. 
Now, I'm no different from the rest of you. I'm not sure I have all the pieces. I'm pretty sure I have a lot of them, more than probably most people. And I'm constantly searching. Um, some of the pieces I share with you, you may already have. Some of them are going to be new for you. Each of us has a different assortment of pieces to the market puzzle. And the goal is for each of us to form a complete picture. So please, I ask that be patient when we're covering something that you know all about. There might be something new to you just around the corner. And though we are primarily building a base for futures trading, these concepts and techniques are equally effective for stocks and options. So I just want to take a minute, get a feel for where everybody's at. Uh, if you trade stocks and options or both, please type in a four. Okay, look at that. All right. A lot of stocks and options traders. That is awesome. Okay, if you've never heard of the e-minis, and don't have a clue what I'm talking about, type in a three. Oh, okay, okay, this is good to know. If you've heard of the e minis but never traded them, type in a two. Okay, 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 good, good. Okay, if you have, <coughs> pardon me, if you have or are now trading futures contracts, type in a one. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces here. Thank you guys for coming. Um, okay, well, we can see that we've got a pretty good range of experience levels here. So I'm thinking the first order of business is to get everyone speaking the same language. Um, we're going to start at the very beginning and work our way toward the end. So if you typed in a one and you're already trading futures Today's class, you know, it, it might be a little basic for you. You're welcome to stay. There might be a worthwhile tidbit here or there. If you check out early, no hard feelings. But if you do leave early, please come back for the next class because the next class is going to clarify some things um, you might be unsure of. It's going to solidify your understanding of some things that have kind of been wavy gravy in your head. And as we progress through the classes, things are going to get way more interesting for you number one typers. All right, everybody, turn off the TV, the cell phone, shut down Skype, Slack, log out of Facebook, Snapchat, shut down Thinkorswim, because we're about to make history with real life trading future, real life tradings, always free, whole year in the making, very first ever futures market class, beginning with why trade futures? Are you a night owl or an early bird? If regular market hours aren't a great fit for your sleep cycle, you might be a futures trader. Um, maybe you've always wanted to tr day trade, but you can't because the market is only open while you're at work. Well, then futures trading might be right for you. Would you like to save uh, a greater portion of your hard-won profits and pay less in taxes? Then futures trading could be right for you. Uh, if you would like to trade more than four round trips per week and never get nailed as a pattern day trader, guess what? You might want to be a futures trader. Ever see tweets in the middle of the night <laughs> saying the market is making a big move? and wished you could trade it or at least protect your positions, then you might want to be a futures trader. <sighs> well, I, I couldn't get Jeff Foxworthy. He wouldn't come tonight. But if you answered yes to any of those questions, I can tell you what you were wishing you could trade. And I bet every one of you already knows the answer. Anybody want to type it in? What do you wish you were trading? <laughs> yes! <sighs> Okay, well, how about this? Have you ever had one of those days when it seems like everybody is making money but you? I mean, it's a huge universe of stocks out there, right? I mean, how many are there? I tried to Google to find out exactly how many stocks are on the stock exchange, and it's somewhere between six and 9,000. I couldn't even get a number. 
900 of those have options. Great. Okay. So that narrows it down a little, but who's got enough eyes, monitors, brain power to watch 900 stocks? It seems like trading equities and options, you just have to accept that some days you're going to miss some awesome trades. But the futures market is a much smaller universe. And if you can keep an eye on five or 10 instruments, you'll find at least one good trade set up a day and usually two or three if you know what to look for and the best times to look. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Am I going too fast? I'm a little excited. <laughs> so what are futures? Okay, you like it fast. Uh, wait, I'm not going there. Okay, so <laughs> what are futures? You've probably all heard stories um, about people who've blown out their accounts in a single trade or woke up with 20,000 cows on their doorstep. Now, I know a few folks who've blown up their accounts. The futures market is a little scary if you don't know what you're doing. But that's why we're here. We're going to replace that fear with knowledge. And no one in this room who pays attention <laughs> will ever wake up to oinkers and cow pies on their doorstep. But before we can even get into the futures market, we have to get super basic for a minute. And just let's say, what is a market? What is a market's purpose? What do you guys think? I mean, don't be shy. Type in your answers. What do you think the purpose of a market is? Oh, very good. Yes. Oh, my God. You guys are amazing. Yeah. It's a place to go to buy stuff. And depending on the type of market, it can be a place to sell stuff, too. So what is the purpose of any market? Be a place to buy or sell. Good. So those are all great answers. Yeah, make money. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of summing up all of those great answers into one succinct phrase. The purpose of the market is to facilitate trade, to make the process of doing business easier, easy, easy for buyers to find what they're looking for, easy for sellers to reach customers, um, easy to actually pass the product and exchange money. So can you guys think of any businesses nowadays that have streamlined the process of buying and selling? Um, <laughs> Jeremy's seen the slides. eBay, oh my God, Amazon, yes, Alibaba, excellent, excellent examples. Now, yeah, I, I especially like the example of eBay because they're an auction-based seller. It's only a one-way auction because you can't buy something on eBay and then sell it right away to someone else who was bidding in that same auction. Um, on eBay, if you want to sell what you just bought, you have to start another auction. So it's not as efficient as the futures market, which is allows us to buy and sell in the same auction. But eBay is a good example of an auction-based facilitator of trade. Cool. Okay. Um, so the purpose of any market is to facilitate trade, to make buying and selling as easy as possible. Why? What does a market get in return for facilitating trade? Spread. Did I stump you guys? <laughs> yes, exactly. They get a cut. Um, if you sell something on eBay, eBay gets a percent of each sale. PayPal. You use PayPal, they take a percent of each sale, and they're not even involved in the, in the selling. They just make, they just facilitate the act of conducting business. So the more sales made on eBay, the more money eBay makes. Anybody lost? Type in a one if you're confused at all. Type in a two if you're like solid gold. You're all over this. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so if eBay wants to make more money, does eBay want to make it easy or difficult to sell stuff? Yeah, easy, of course. eBay wants to facilitate trade because the more trades that go down, the more money eBay makes. It's that simple, right? 
That's the purpose of any market. The supermarket, the farmer's market, a car dealer, the swap meet. Somebody wants to sell, somebody's looking to buy, and the market brings the buyers and sellers together or makes it easier for buyers and sellers to do business. Now, most markets are specialized, and nobody goes to a car dealer to buy a prom dress, right? Okay, we're almost ready to answer the question, what are futures? But it's really hard to talk about futures without talking about commodities first. Commodities are the reason futures contracts exist. Okay, so what's a commodity? Well, let's start with an easy answer. I'm gonna let Mr. Duke take it away. We are here to try to explain to you what it is we do here. We are commodities brokers, William. Now, what are commodities? Commodities are agricultural products, like coffee that you had for breakfast, wheat, which is used to make bread, pork bellies, which is used to make bacon, which you might find in a bacon and lettuce and tomato sandwich. And then there are other commodities, like frozen orange juice and gold. Though, of course, gold doesn't grow on trees like oranges. <laughs> Uh, clear so far? Yeah. Good, William. Now, uh, some of our clients are speculating that the price of gold will rise in the future, and we have other clients who are speculating that the price of gold is going to fall. Uh, they place their orders with us, and we buy or sell their gold for them. Tell them the good part. <laughs> uh, the good part, William, is that uh, no matter whether our clients make money or lose money, Duke and Duke get the commissions. Well, what do you think, Valentine? Well, it sounds to me like you guys are a couple of bookies. <laughs> I told you he'd understand. <laughs> Basically, commodities are, <laughs> they are the atoms of every consumer product on the planet. They're raw materials, in their most basic state. Um, they're used to produce each and every consumer product. If you eat it, wear it, ride in it, it's made from commodities. So there's a lot of demand for different commodities. Pork bellies, yummy. Yeah, I like bacon. Mmm, bacon. Uh, commodities fall into two categories, hard and soft. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay, um, they're mined or they're drilled. Uh, oil, natural gas, gold, silver, these are all hard commodities. Again, um, those are the major ones. There's a lot of other things, but not all of them move enough in a day to be worth a day trader's time. Um, some of the best for day trading, crude oil, natural gas, gold. Soft commodities are agricultural products. Um, things that are grown or raised, these are, these are some of the notables. Um, and you don't have to memorize any of this to trade. Most soft commodities aren't that great for day trading. Personally, when it comes to softs, <laughs> um, it's very rare that I day trade the softs. Now, to facilitate trade, all commodities share certain characteristics or standards. Uh, each characteristic is designed to facilitate trade by appealing to as many buyers as possible and limiting negotiation to price alone. Um, the characteristics are a little different for each commodity, but we can generalize a little bit. Um, so which do you think will facilitate trade the most? A, a market with lots of interested buyers, or B, a market with a small number of buyers? Yes, yes, A, absolutely. You guys are all over it. The larger the number of buyers, the more liquid the market, right? And that's why real life trading recommends only trading stocks with a certain amount of, at least a certain amount of volume each day. For a commodity to be useful to the largest possible group of buyers, the commodity has to be in its simplest, most natural straight state. 
for agricultural and industrial commodities, they call that state raw. The raw state is the first uniform characteristic of a commodity. Um, just to go with an example, corn. People eat it, we feed it to animals, we plant it for another crop of corn. We can refine it into fuel for cars, vehicles. It can be made into plastic. I mean, there's a big market for corn. But once it's transformed from its raw state, say it's been dried and ground up, the group of buyers that use dried ground corn is a subset of all the corn buyers. So it's a smaller market. Um, the agricultural industry can't plant ground corn and expect a crop to come up. And none of these guys use ground corn. Now, yeah, there's probably a big market for dried ground up corn. But then there's a lot more questions too. How ground up is the corn? Is it cracked? Is it meal? Is it coarse? Is it corn flour? Is it corn powder? Each has its uses, but the number of buyers is smaller than the market for raw corn. And then there's more questions. How is it packaged? Is it bagged? Is it in burlap? Is it in barrels? Is it cotton, paper, plastic? Is it canned? How big are the cans? Are they by weight? Aluminum, steel, tin, plastic? The questions multiply, and that's just from grinding the corn. So we talked about the purpose of the market. It's to facilitate trade, right? So having to ask a lot of questions and get them answered, does, does that slow down the sales process or speed it up? Yeah. Yes, very good, Richard, Daniel, for me, um, all of you. Yes, it slows it down. So do questions facilitate trade? Exactly. The more refined the commodity, the more refined the market. As a commodity is refined, its market shrinks, uniform quality becomes less assured. Refining transforms a commodity into a product. Hence, all the different brands of frozen corn, canned corn, tortillas, corn oil, ethanol. The stock market is for trading brands. We're talking futures. Futures trade commodities. Commodities are raw materials, the basic building blocks of all commerce. Now, I have another question for you. Do you think most buyers have the time or the inclination to fly all over the world inspecting each producer's commodity? I mean, it's a job I'd like to have. Think of the frequent flyer miles. But what company is going to cover that expense if they don't have to, right? Well, guess what? The market thought of that. To facilitate trade, the market guarantees the quality. For commodity to be saleable in the futures market, it has to meet a minimum standard of quality. It must be usable. Oils, metals must be unadulterated. Cows have to be healthy. Grains free from rot. For commodities, blah, I don't know why I keep tripping on that word. For commodities to be bought and sold globally, there has to be a uniformity in form. That's the raw state. The quality has to be usable and pure. And there's one last thing here, weight and measure. A minimum, <laughs> can anybody tell me, um, what's a bushel? Anybody know what a bushel is? Oh, <laughs> yes, a unit of measure, weight of wheat. Okay, four pecks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll stop the pain. A bushel is a basket. Now, it used to be a bushel of wheat or a bushel of corn was measured by how much wheat or corn fit in the basket. Um, so bushels were measured in volume, which makes sense if you're measuring milk or oil, but it does not make any sense for wheat or corn, right? I mean, is the basket loosely filled or is it densely filled? Is the top mounded or flat? Is it filled to the rim or a little below? And on top of that, there are two different kinds of bushels. Um, there's the US bushel that's 35.2 liters. And then there's an imperial bushel that's 36.4 liters. So not all bushels are even the same. <laughs> a bushel of wheat 
No, I am not related to Nina Blackwood. <laughs> so a bushel of wheat from one farmer could contain less wheat than another farmer's bushel. Or settling during transport could make a bushel seem skimpy, even though it was full when it started out. So is it easy to make a deal if you don't know how much you're getting for your money? No, of course not. So commodities are standardized for weight and measure. Now, there's one more characteristic that makes a commodity a commodity. It's, it's the one thing we haven't discussed yet. And I'm wondering if anyone can guess what I'm thinking. Um, well, this isn't really an easy question. I'll give you a hint. Um, the last character reason, character reason, wow, I made a new word. The last character reason is why people like us are trading commodities. And it's the only reason eBay, Amazon, Travelocity, CarMax, Etsy, any of those companies are in business. Yeah. John Wheeler nails it on the nosy. Money. Price. For a commodity to be worthy of a market, its price has to fluctuate. Price can change for any reason, seasonal demand or availability, economic change, new uses, natural disaster, geopolitical events, whatever the reason for the market to exist, the price has to change over time. If the price doesn't move, we don't need to facilitate trade, everything's set. Um, if the price is always the same, there's no need for buyers or sellers to hedge against the possibility of future price increases or decreases. And the seasonal price fluctuation of soft commodities is why the futures market came into being. Now, commodities are the original underlying instruments of futures contracts, but they are no longer the only underlying instrument of a futures contracts, nor are they the best for day traders. In my opinion, the best commodities for day traders are financial instruments. The non-commodity commodities. As the world got smaller and the markets globalized, it became necessary to hedge against price changes in currency or interest rates and other financial instruments like the stock indexes themselves. Many people refer to these products as, as commodities, and in a way, yeah, maybe they are. I'm always going to call them financial instruments. And these include the e-minis, which are futures contracts on the stock indexes. Um, let me grab this pen. So the ES minis track the S&P 500, 500, and that's this chart. Whoa, that wasn't supposed to happen. Hang on, let me go back. Okay, let me try it over here. Sorry guys, I've done this before once or twice and somehow everything's different tonight. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dawn. Um, I don't see a lot of price from mar influence from market engineers, but we'll get to that in the later, later classes, I promise you. So up here, Oh, look, I found a way for it to work. Okay, this is the chart for the SPX. In the middle here, this is SPY. Let's see, I'm not as good at this as Jeremy. <laughs> a little slow. This is the SPY ETF. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. And down here, this is the ES, ES minis, futures contracts based on the SPX. Now, both. SPY and the ES are derivative products of the S&P 500, the SPX. So they all move the same way at the same time. Uh, so why trade the ES mini? What's the big deal? Well, there's a few reasons. The first one is easy. You cannot directly trade SPX. The only trade, the only way to trade the SPX is with options. And SPX and the SPY ETF only trade during market hours. They don't really trade 23 hours a day like the ES minis. But what is it that really makes an instrument good to day trade, right? <laughs> um, momentum, range, risk versus reward potential. Those are the things we're looking for. Um, 
again, we're back to price has to move. And the farther it moves, the better. Can we, do we agree on that? Price move, big range, yeah, momentum, all right, great. So let's take a closer look at the price movement of these three instruments. Now, this is just an average day. I picked it at random. It happens to be May 4, 2017. So let's look at the price movement. The daily range from low to high. The bigger, the better. That's what day traders want, big range. So just to be fair, I'm only going to compare the regular session trading hours. So S&P 500, range of this particular day, 11 points. We'll call it 11 points. That's easier. Okay. Um, but the only way to trade that is with options. So we've got the Greeks and the market maker and <laughs> not my favorite kind of guy. Now, um, the SPY. Daily range, 1.14 points. Uh, anybody here ever trade SPY? Moves with SPX, its value is about 10% of the S&P 500. So the range should be 10%, which is what it is. So 1.14 points, that's not much of a range for day trading really. That's more like scalping kind of stuff. But that same day, Oh, pardon me. The ES Mini had the biggest range of all of them. 14.75 points, 59 ticks in an average day. Um, 59 ticks, each tick is worth 12.50. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but we'll cover ticks and points in class three. For now, we're just looking at the daily range. Which one of these three has the biggest daily range? I'll give you a hint. Yes. <laughs> so here's a question you can't answer now. Um, if you have one share of SPY and SPY moves a dollar 14, or excuse me, 1.14, oh, I totally blew it. How much money do you get? If SPY moves 1.14 and you have one share, how much money? Yep. Exactly, a dollar fourteen. So let me tell you another reason to trade the ES Mini Futures contract instead of the SPY ETF. Leverage. SPY has no leverage. One point one four in SPY is a buck fourteen in cash. Are you ready for this? Anybody want to guess how much money you get for fifty nine ticks in the ES Minis? Each tick is worth twelve fifty. And I know some of you know this, you one typers. I'm. Ah, oh, Jenny, well done, my dear. A whole bunch. Okay, well, here we go. Um, 737 dollars and 50 cents for one contract. Now, to be fair, it's pretty rare to enter at the absolute low of the day and get out at the absolute high of the day. Don't think that way when you're trading. The goal is to capture most of it. But just to keep things simple, let's pretend this trade captured the entire day range of the SPY. So we got $1.14 for our eight hours of sitting in front of the computer trading. But... That same trade, same day in the ES minis, we got 59 ticks, each took worth 1250. That day's move in the futures contracts made $737.50. So it's the same 0.5% move. Which would you rather have for it? A dollar fourteen or seven hundred thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents? Yeah, me too. The 700, it, it, that's 100 bucks an hour plus, and it takes care of your commissions. Okay, um, so SPX made that same sexy move, and it is the instrument that the ES Minis and Spire derive from, but SPX only trades options, and please forgive me, but with the Greeks and the market maker, I'm not going to try and figure out what the day's range would be worth. SPX, yeah, it probably made decent money, but the Greeks make figuring an exact number complicated and the market maker doesn't always play fair. SPY, we got a buck 14. 
That's why the spy guy, the spy guy spy has a dinky little knife. But the ES Mini, that same day's range, is worth that seventh. Now that's the bomb. So say hello to my little friends. These are the E-mini futures for all the U.S. indexes, not just the S&P. There's a futures market for the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the Russell. Now, hang in there, guys, because by the end of the first four classes, you will know what everything on this table means. But there's more to the financials than just the indexes. Uh, we could trade interest rates by trading treasury bonds, uh, the infamous deliverable swaps, and we can trade currencies without braving the wild, unregulated West world of Forex. Instead of choosing a currency pair like in Forex in the futures market, you select the currency you want to trade, and it trades against whatever denomination of currency your account is. But the biggest difference between trading currency futures and trading Forex, and the reason I don't trade Forex. In the Forex market, there's no guarantor. If your broker goes belly up because they extended too much leverage to their traders, you may never see your profits. You may lose access to your account, or even the whole account, for months or even years. Yes, the currencies are all futures contracts. Um, it can and it does happen. When the Swiss franc depegged from the euro last year, several forex industry giant brokers fell. They just defaulted on everything and those people didn't see their money for years. In the futures market, payment is guaranteed by an exchange, which brings us back once more to the purpose of the market. What is it, guys? Type it in. What's the purpose of the market? Money. <laughs> well, okay. To facilitate trade. Very good. Okay. So the exchange, that's the facilitator. The exchange sets the standards for the commodities. All the contract terms except price and except price. Um, it acts as a guarantor for every transaction. And what that means to you and me, if we make money on our trades, we actually get it. Without the exchange, there is no guarantee of payment. That's why I don't trade forward contracts or Forex. There's no guarantor. An exchange, just like eBay, the exchange gets a fee for every trade and charges a fee for supplying accurate intraday data. Now, there's lots of exchanges all over the world. Each offers different standardized instruments for trade. The largest futures exchange is the CME Group, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange mostly because of CME's electronic trading system, Globex. But the oldest one that started it all, at least in this country, is the CBOT, the Chicago Board of Trade. Before the Chicago Board of Trade, the natural cycle of planting and harvesting created huge price swings in the grain markets. Um, in the fall at harvest, Chicago, that was where the Chicago Board of Trade is, would be flooded with grain and the farmers would be forced to sell at prices that didn't even cover their production costs. So some years, farmers burned their grain for winter heat rather than spend money on storage or shipping. The farmers who did ship and couldn't get a decent price would leave their wheat and their corn to rot in the Chicago streets or they'd dump it into Lake Michigan rather than pay for storage or the cost to ship it back home. So the farmer would then be forced to negotiate a guaranteed price for forward delivery on a future crop to buy the seed to plant that crop. So anybody want to make a guess what those forward delivery contracts were called? I, I kind of gave you a hint a few minutes ago, but it's a trick question, like who's buried in Grant's tomb? Yeah, I know. It was mean. They're called forward contracts, and they're the forerunners of today's futures contracts. Forward contracts, they're still traded today. The only difference is they are not traded through an exchange, which means, like Forex, there is no entity guaranteeing anyone will get paid or get the stuff they paid for. 
Oh, and I've lost my mouse somewhere. There it is. Anyway, <laughs> the farmers were, were trapped in a spiral of rising debt with each year they planted. So credit defaults would ripple through the business community. And credit defaults are a big deal. That's a big part of how the Great Depression began. It's what bankrupted Lehman Brothers and began the first Great Recession of, our, of this century. Um, if farmers stored their grain and waited till winter, when the scarcity created high prices, their grain was worth more. But storage and transportation were monopolized and therefore you know, expensive. And the standards to determine quality were subjective. Weights, measures varied. Corn, wheat, soybeans, all sold by the bushel. And we talked about those pesky things. There were just way too many variables complicating trade. So a group of businessmen took matters into their own hands in an attempt to facilitate trade. Rumor has it they got together in a room above a feed store and hammered out some solutions to the problems plaguing the grain markets. Um, the board, hallelujah, dumped the volume bushel, standardized the infamous bushel to be a weight instead of a volume. Grain was sorted and graded and stored in communal communal vents, which ensured uniform quality. And the board created a marketplace where farmers could deliver their commodities and sell on the spot for cash. And it worked. Prices stabilized in the off season. And since the grain was stored at this exchange, that credit risk of people not delivering what they had been paid for months earlier was eliminated. The marketplace suddenly was functioning. The buyer got what they paid for at the agreed price, and the farmers were able to lock in a profitable future price. The Chicago Board of Trade thrived, and it became the model for commodity exchanges all over the world. Um, the exchange ensured uniformity of the commodities, guaranteed payment and delivery, and smoothed out the seasonal price fluctuations. So instead of trekking from buyer to buyer, the farmer delivered the harvest to the exchange, and in exchange, haha, <laughs> get it, exchange, the farmer would get a receipt, just a piece of paper describing the quantity and quality of the commodity delivered. Then the farmer, instead of hauling his stuff all over town, took that little piece of paper to prospective buyers. The buyer looked at the receipt, instantly knew the quality, the quantity, and could simply buy the piece of paper from the farmer and take that receipt at any time to the exchange for pickup. Or what they discovered was they could resell the receipt to someone else. Business became so much easier. Brokers began to just trade those receipts like, like baseball cards. Instead of storing bags of wheat and corn in warehouses, they just had a pile of receipts in their safe. Those receipts were the first standardized, exchange-traded, forward contracts. Now, who can tell me what those exchange-traded forward contracts were called? Do, 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 do. Yes, futures! We made it. Those are the futures contracts. Now, I want, <laughs> I want to take a minute here to think about what those businessmen who started the Chicago Board of Trade accomplished. The grain market was pretty messed up, right? I mean, crops rotting in the streets in the fall, scams and ripoffs all through the winter months. But this small group of businessmen solved a lot of the problems that were getting in the way of business, standardized and simplified the process of buying, selling, pickup, delivery, making it easier and safer for people to do business. They streamlined the process of buying and selling. <laughs> they facilitated trade. And the futures market is the direct product of their process. They created the first futures contracts out of the need to facilitate the agricultural commodities business. <sighs> now that we've got all that under our belt, we're ready to talk about futures contracts and the futures markets. So let's start with the contracts. 
The terms of a futures contract are standardized, defined, like we talked about earlier, in quantity, quality, and delivery date. But those terms are different from instru instrument to instrument. Different corn, different from wheat, different from gold, different from the, the EOS Mini. And the same instrument may be traded on different exchanges and have different terms. So it is really important to know your instruments and to which exchange your brokerage is allowing you to trade on. Futures contracts are derivatives, meaning they're based on another source. Uh, like our earlier example of the ES Minis and the SPY ETF, those are both derivatives of the S&P 500. Futures have supercharged leverage. We saw the power of leverage when we compared the values of the range of the SPY worth a buck 14 and the ES Mini, same range, worth $737.50. You still with me? Awesome. <laughs> okay. Futures contracts are only traded through an exchange. If a contract is not traded through an exchange, it is not a futures contract. Why? Because with futures contracts, the exchange guarantees that both parties will honor their obligations under the legal terms of the futures contract. Okay. That's right. <laughs> both the buyer and the seller are obligated to fulfill the terms of the contract. That's that delivery of oinkers part. Don't want 40,000 pounds of oinkers? Then offset the obligation before assignment. Now, offset's just a fancy word for traded away. Close the, close the position before the terms of the contract go into effect. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here's the definition of futures contract from the primary authority, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Now, just like the Securities and Exchange Commission oversees and regulates the stock markets, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission oversees and regulates the futures markets. Um, the CFTC has like a really great, uh, simple, easy to understand a definition if you're fluent in legalese. So let's just take a look at the NASDAQ definition down here, particularly from this point forward. A futures contract differs from an option and then an option gives one of the parties a right and the other an obligation to buy or sell. While a futures contract represents an obligation to both counterparties. With an options contract, the buyer is in control, right? An option buyer has the right, but not the obligation to exercise the option. Whether the option's in the money, out of the money, if the option expires in the money, the buyer can still opt not to exercise. Only the seller is obligated by an options contract. And an options contract can expire worthless if it's not exercised. Not only can, but does. Futures contracts are different. Because both the buyer and the seller are obligated, a futures contract never expires worthless. In the money, out of the money, those terms don't apply to futures contracts at all. The buyer and seller agree to exchange a certain amount of cash for a certain amount of goods. They are both obligated and the exchange holds them both to the agreement. With a futures contract, the exchange is in control and a deal is a deal. Nobody can change their mind. Both the buyer and seller are obligated. The only way out of that obligation is to offset your position. Offset just means close it, trade it to someone else. There are are a lot more differences between options contracts and futures contracts. <clears throat> Pardon me, but we'll save that for our next awesome, absolutely free, real life futures trading class. We got through a lot tonight. Um, the commodities, hards, softs, financials, purpose of the market, the exchanges, how the futures market was born and why, and a little bit about the futures contracts themselves. Next class, 
<laughs> it's over already. <laughs> it's been an hour. <laughs> Next class, we're going to go into depth in the into the futures contracts, how they're very similar, but also very different from options contracts. Simple terms like expiration, assignment, and margin have entirely different meanings in the future market. By the end of class two, you're going to understand the difference and what it means to you as a trader. Now, for those of you trading already, class two might kind of sound like a class you can just skip but I'll be sharing some pretty crucial information in class two that some of you already trading futures contracts just might not be aware of um, like how the FIFO rule could be devastating your account if you're legging out and how the nightly mark to market affects your cash balance um, anyway I I want to thank you all for attending and sharing in this historic first ever futures class from real life trading. Um, I'll hang out a little while in case anybody still has any unanswered questions or is confused. I'll do my best to clarify any questions that maybe I can help or at least tell you where to look. Actually, Sammy, they don't ship the tons of corn, um, but we're going to get into that really in depth in class two. Um, it, the corn actually sits at the exchange waiting for you to pick it up while you pay insurance and storage fees and of course you have to pay for it up front um, but but yeah it's it's a pain that you do not want to get involved with wow these questions really come fast Jeremy I got it handed to you you are amazing <laughs> okay other than TD Ameritrade there are tons of futures brokers we're going to get into uh, the some futures brokers in class four. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, trading futures in an IRA, I am not sure of the answer to that question, but I will find out for you, John. Uh, it never even occurred to me to do that. Uh, what's my edge? Well, I'm going to be sharing my edge over the next eight to ten classes, so you're just going to have to wait for the answer to that one. Um. <laughs> yes, I will definitely give you guys plenty of information. I will share charts with you, what platforms I think are best. Um. I'm not really going to go into the brokers. I'll tell you who I use and if I'm and who I have used and who pleased me and who did not. Um, yes, class four, we'll get into brokers. Uh, live chat room to trade. You know, Dennis, that's uh, still open for debate and we're we're talking about ways to figure out something for you guys. Uh, as long as you're not the only person interested, hopefully we can get something set up. Um, gold futures, we will definitely be covering gold futures in depth. Uh, class two is next Thursday, same time, same bad station. Uh, they can't hold the S&P at the exchange. <laughs> Interactive brokers, I do believe they have futures trading. Uh, we'll get into expiration and stuff like that in the future class. Yes, Infinity Futures is in insanely flexible with what you can do. Uh, I know how to do IRA. You need to find a custodian, only a few out there. Uh, Carol, that's tricky. And thank you for coming, my dear. It's great to see you. If you are completely new to trading, can you start off in futures? Keith? That is an, uh, an awesome question, and the answer is yes. But if you are completely new to trading, there's a lot you have to, to learn and practice before you start trading real money. Personally, I wish I had started in futures and not wasted my time with all that other stuff before. Um, <laughs> thank you, Sammy. That's always good to hear. Sonia, um, that's my goal to do some live trading to as a group uh, once we get past these basic classes and some of the more advanced stuff but you know because we're doing these classes in the evening we can 
only trade what the market gives us. And if the market isn't giving us anything, there's no point to trading live. Um, wow, these messages. Uh, Jeremy, how do you do this? Katiana, that's great. It's good to know. I'm. <laughs> Uh, but the ES twenty four forty seven thirty two price that is is it okay? Anytime you've got something that isn't, if you're talking about Frederick, I'm trying to answer your question. Price that is current. If it's twenty four forty seven thirty two, that is not a price that is going to be for the ES mini. My guess is you're pulling that price from the S and P five hundred itself, the SPX. Um, we'll get into ticks and points. I think that's class three. There will be eight classes for sure. I'm considering adding two more just to be able to, to help you guys a little bit more and give you something really comprehensive to, to deal with <laughs> trading futures. Um, oh, you're welcome. Weekly options, newsletters, trades with futures. Uberto, I think that's what you're asking. Um, I think for now we're just going to focus in a, uh, in a good way on the futures contracts themselves. The futures are a derivative of, the, of another product. And then to trade options on futures, then you're trading a derivative of a derivative. And that can get pretty complicated and... It's not like trading options on stocks. Options on futures are insanely expensive uh, because of the leverage. Maybe that's a class to think about in the future. Um, Lyril, awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate your, your comments. Um, yes, we will definitely be walking through trades. Uh, obviously not in this first set of classes. Is there an account that is too small for futures? Yeah, you're going to want to have, you know, I, I strongly advise you really do want to try to have like $5,000 in your account so that you don't just get creamed with margin. Um, that, would be, that would be as small as I would comfortably go. Now, there's brokers out there that will let you trade with considerably less. I just worry about the safety of it. Um, we'll get into that more later. This will be posted on the site. Uh, yeah, so register for class two. Good night, Baz, thank you for coming. Thomas, thank you. Um, <laughs> Brandon, thanks. You guys, it's been a great night. Um, very excited. I do not know who the genius who created the contract month letters. Um, <laughs> and we will get into the best times to trade. Um, they move 24 hours, well, 23 hours, seven hours a day. Lyril, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> One-on-one -on -one training in futures. You're rich, good-looking, and looking. Well, let's let's get a few more classes under our belt and see how things go from there, Soro. Avery, um, I do still trade equity options, but it's it's just swing trading occasionally when I just see an opportunity. Um, really, I trade futures. That's it. Well, I think this is going on YouTube. <laughs> I do not trade Forex. As I mentioned earlier, Forex is unregulated. There's no guarantor. Um. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you. Um, I think I've gotten to everyone's questions. Um. <laughs> Matthew, we have three more on basics of futures. Then there will be four more 
thank you. Jeremy answered your question in two seconds, way quicker than me. All right, you guys, I'm going to call it a night. Thank you all for coming. Um, hope to see you all on Thursday, class two. And with that, I think I shall bid you all adieu.